These are the three things that will make your marriage wonderful. You belong, you are home, and it's funny. And when you have these three things, you're going to love it. So here's the problem. The problem is, we're talking about love and marriage. But love and marriage don't go together. You have to make up a choice. You want love or you want marriage. The reason they don't go together is because love is about me, marriage is about you. Love is about me. Even when I say, I love you, that's about me. I'm telling you something about me. You want to know who I am? I love sushi. I love chandeliers. And I love you. So what do you now know? Now you know me. It's all about me. And that's why if a husband says to his wife, I love you, don't say, I love you. Don't start an argument. When he says, I love you, he's saying something about himself. Then you say, and I love you. What, you just changed the subject. He was talking about himself, and you're talking about yourself. That's why it doesn't work. He says three words, and you already changed the subject. That's all he gets, three words. So he says, I love you. And you say, OK, enough about you. Now I love you. This is not good communication. Certainly, when I want you to love me, that's selfish. But even when I love you, it's still selfish. I mean, even look at the, look at the sentence. I love you. Three little words. The first word is I. The last word is you. So I'm first, you're last. <laughs> and love, <laughs> see, I, 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 I'm me. I, I, I have to be me. Love, got to have love. You. If I don't love you, I'll love somebody else. But So you're replaceable. I'm not replaceable. Love is not replaceable. Only you. So when a husband says to his wife, I love you, it's a threat. I love you, so watch it. You better behave yourself. Because I come first, you come last. Love is selfish. Marriage is the exact opposite. Marriage means this is all about you. Because without you, I'm nothing. You don't get married to become perfect. You don't get married to improve yourself. You get married to devote yourself to someone else. That's marriage. If you just want somebody to love, you don't have to get married. So a man and a woman who already love each other, why would they get married? For what? 
for the love that they already have? What's the marriage going to add? So love and marriage don't go together like a horse and carriage. <laughs> that was an old song, but it's not true. Here's another problem. Doctors are saying that the biggest threat to health, not psychiatrists, regular doctors, hospitals, they're saying now that the, that the biggest threat to our health is loneliness. When people feel alone, they become vulnerable and they easily get sick. Serious sicknesses because of loneliness. And that's why it's such a terrible thing that people put their parents into old age homes and forget about them. It's terrible. Loneliness is the worst thing. I remember not so long ago, everybody was saying, the worst thing you can do to somebody is make them feel guilty. Remember that? What are you, giving me a guilt complex? Jewish mothers were the worst because they made you feel guilty. And making somebody feel guilty was the worst thing you could do. Now they changed it. Guilt is not so bad. Alone, terrible. And it's true. Physically, when a person feels all alone in the world, their immune system crashes and they become vulnerable to every disease. The, the, the problem becomes even more complicated because the doctors go looking for the cause of the disease and they blame it on, on bacteria and about germs and on viruses and on super germs. And really, it's because they're lonely. So you, you treat all the symptoms and they don't get better. So being alone is physically dangerous. But the rabbi quoted, the Gemara says, the Torah says, It's not good when a person is alone. It's true. But the question is why? Why is it not good for a person to be alone? Wouldn't it be perfect if a person can be alone, independent, and not need anybody else? Wouldn't that be the most perfect, the healthiest, strongest person? If you need somebody else because by yourself you're lonely, then you're dependent on somebody else. So if the person who loves you stops loving you, you're in trouble. So it would be much better if people were good alone. So this is a question that very few people ask. God created the world in six days. On Sunday, he said, Yihi Eir. Monday, there was Rekia. Tuesday, no place did God say, it's not good enough, I think I'm going to make trees. He made trees. Then he made little animals. He didn't say, mm, it's not good, little, you have to have big animals also, so I'm going to make big animals. Only when it comes to Adam and Chava, God made a statement. Oh, it's not good to be alone, so I'm going to create a wife. Just do it. You don't have to make statements. Why, did, why does, does he have to say it's not good? So the Medrash actually says, the world was created with ten 
sentences. One of the ten sentences is which means by nature, logically, it would be much better if a person could be independent, perfect by himself. But God said no. He made it bad to be alone. <coughs> One of the reasons is because Adam is created B'Tselem Elokim. God created Adam because God doesn't want to be alone. And since he is not good being alone, he makes the human being like himself that the human being also can't stand being alone. <coughs> so, not being content to be alone, that's being like God. Because human beings would much rather be alone. And, and, and perfect. Why should I need you to be healthy? So this is what marriage is. Marriage means, since you are created in God's image, and he doesn't want to be alone, you also should not be alone. You should have someone beside you. So what is marriage? Marriage is not to make you perfect, to have someone beside you. So let's understand this. God is already perfect. In all ways, God is perfect. He's infinite, bligvul, ein sof, kol yachol. He's perfect. He can't get any better. And he's not happy. What does that mean? He creates a world. For what? What could he possibly gain when he's already God, he's already perfect? The only answer is that he doesn't gain anything But it being himself is not enough. That's real humility. As perfect as he is, there's just him. Just me. Not right. What's missing? Nothing's missing. But just me is not right in God's eyes. So, what does he gain? He doesn't gain something. He gains someone. He has someone besides him. So the purpose of creation is that we should exist, not that he should be better. You know, think about this. In order for us to exist, look what he had to do. He has to limit himself. Tzimtzum. He has to remove his light to make room for us. He has to hide his face so that we could have free choice. He has to send the neshama, a little piece of himself, from the highest level down to the lowest level. He has to create sin. He has to make the moon smaller. All of these things he does not like. Goes against, against the, the, the perfection. And he does all of this just so that we also exist, not just him. So when you read in the Torah, particularly in Kabbalah and Hasidut, 
in the beginning there was just him. He was everything and there was nothing else. You think that's a compliment? The Torah is trying to tell us how great he is. No. The Torah is telling us what the problem was. The problem was there was only him. What's wrong with that? Nobody knows. But to God, just me is not enough. There has to be someone else. So in Kabbalah it says that when God said, He was talking about himself. Adam HaElyon. So, love and marriage. You don't need love. You don't need love from your husband. You don't need love from your wife. Love is not a need. Let's make this very clear. In America, love is God. It's Avodah Zarah. Literally, Avodah Zarah. In history, when people will look back at 20th century, 21st century America, they will all say, the idol, the god of America was love. And every idol is false. You don't need love. Of course, every psychologist and every book you read and even most rabbis will tell you love is the most important thing. It's not true. Love is not a need. Love is a pleasure. If you need love, you're miserable. <laughs> if you need love, you're an unhappy person. Why would you need love? What's wrong with you? Nobody loves me. So? <laughs> so what? There's some law that says you have to be loved? Some guy once came running to the rabbi in the shtetl. He says, Rebbe, Rebbe, people, people don't love me. They say they don't love me. So the rabbi said, Shah, don't have to tell everybody. <laughs> and why should they love you? If nobody loves you, there's probably a good reason. The need for love is a handicap. We shouldn't have that need. Of course, we love love. That's not a need. We love chocolate. It's not a need. If you need chocolate, uh, you're in trouble. You also need therapy. So, you don't need love from your husband, and you don't need love from your wife, and you certainly don't need love from your children. My children don't love me. That's it? That's your problem? I was once speaking in uh, Beis Chana in class. One father came to sit in. These were a group of teenage girls. We were talking about kabed et avicha vesimecha. And I said, the word is kabed. It doesn't say to love your father. It says to honor. It doesn't even say to respect. Why? Not every father is lovable. So you can't make a commandment, you must love your father. What if he's not lovable? And you can't make a commandment, respect your father. He didn't do anything special. There's nothing to respect. But honor is always possible. Honor means don't sit in his chair. Doesn't matter whether you love him or you respect him. It's his chair. You don't sit in his chair. So this father got really angry. He started screaming, 
I'm not accepting that. I don't want honor. I want her to respect me. <laughs> you just made it very hard on her to respect you. <laughs> you just ruined your chances. And I don't think she's going to love you after this either. Don't need love. You can't demand love. You can't expect love. Then what is marriage? Listen to the story. Back in the terrible times in Russia, the Rebbe then declared war on communism. He didn't want to run away. He wanted to destroy communism. Why? Because communism is evil, it's unholy, and our job is to clean up the world from unholiness. So to run away is not good enough. So he declared war against communism. In the long run, he was victorious. Communism is gone, Judaism is alive and well all over Russia. But during that war, he drafted his chassidim to fight the battles, and many, many chassidim died. In the gulags, in the labor camps, firing squads, Siberia. Almost every Chabad family lost a husband or a son, a father. There was one young couple the communists were looking for him. He did something terrible. I think he stole the Sefer Torah out of a shul that they condemned. So they went to a non-Jewish village or town to hide there. They wouldn't, they wouldn't find him. But they did find him, and the guy was sent off to Siberia. Now the mother was alone with her eight-year-old son. There was nothing, there was no money, there was nothing to eat. So she had to travel to the big city where, where she had some family to get money, food for her son. But the boy could not travel, because if you know, in those days, when a child was born to a Chabad family, they bribed the hospital not to register the birth. Because if there's, a re if there's a record of the child being born, then when the child is six, they're gonna come and take him to the communist school. So to avoid sending your kids to communist school, you bribed the nurse not to register the birth. So officially, this boy did not exist. He certainly couldn't travel, because in Russia, you can't move without papers. So she had no choice. She had to leave him with a non-Jewish couple, old couple, who was a neighbor, eight-year-old boy. She told the boy what he can eat in the house, by the, by the non-Jews, and what he shouldn't eat. And she told him that she'll be back in four days. She didn't come back in four days. A week went by, she did not come back. Two weeks go by, she doesn't come back. Her papers were not perfect. They stopped her at every station. It was, it was bad times. The husband of this couple would come home drunk, and he enjoyed forcing the boy to eat non-kosher meat. Forcing him physically, pushing it into his mouth. What kind of meat it was? It was not cow. It was dead animals. Nobody, nobody had money. The boy would fight and bite and scream and spit it out and cry every night. 
the older woman, the wife, couldn't take all the screaming. And so when the mother doesn't come home after two weeks, she took the boy and put him into an orphanage. In the orphanage, they didn't force him to eat what he didn't want, but they made fun of him. They questioned him, what's wrong with you? This is modern times. We don't do that anymore. There was another boy in, in the city. He would go to school, to the communist school, but on Shabbos, he would come with a Band-Aid on his hand, so he shouldn't write, can't write, or his whole arm was in a sling. Every Shabbos, something was wrong with his hand. The teacher, of course, realized what, he, what he's doing, so she lectured him. Now, the children there were trained Never mention anyone's name. Never, never mention a name. So the teacher sat down with him and said, you know, there's this old-fashioned idea about God and religion and Shabbos, but we outgrew that. We're much healthier. So who told you not to write on Shabbos? Now, any name that he would give would be dead. So he said, my grandmother, who, who had passed away already. So the teacher said, ah, you see? It's from that generation. It's a grandmother. It's a bobbimice. <laughs> it's not for our generation. So take off the Band-Aid and do your work. So this kid, brilliant little boy, started to cry. And the teacher said, why are you crying? He said, because I'm a member in the Communist Youth Party. And part of becoming a member of the Communist Youth Party is that you swear to always keep your word. I promised my grandmother I wouldn't write on Shabbos. Now you're telling me to, to not keep my word, and then I won't be a good communist. <laughs> the teacher didn't know what to say, and she left him alone. <coughs> so here is this eight-year-old boy in an orphanage. And they're questioning him, and they make fun of him. One day, the orphanage takes all the boys on a hike. It was a hot day, and they became thirsty. So they went into a farm, and they asked the farmer if he has a cold drink for the, for the boys. The farmer goes down to his cellar, and he brings out a bottle of milk, gives each boy a glass, and fills it with milk. This little boy is about to drink the milk when he hears the farmer saying, it's so good that you stopped here today. It's very, very good for the young boys because there's nothing healthier than horse's milk. The little boy didn't know what to do. Didn't know what to do. He's thirsty. He wants to drink, but it's not kosher. If he doesn't drink it, it's going to start a whole new conversation with questions, with doesn't need the hassle. So, so he is going to drink it, but, but, you're not, but it's not kosher. An eight-year-old child struggling with a moral question. In the end, he decided not to drink it and to avoid questioning he made believe that the glass slipped out of his hand, and it spilled. Now the mother came back. She goes to the neighbor and says, where's my boy? And the neighbor says, no, we, we put him in an orphanage. She got really scared, because children disappeared regularly in those days. 
So she runs to the orphanage, and she comes in and says, I'm here to pick up my boy, and they said, he's not here now. So she really panicked. They're playing games, she'll never see her boy again. So there's nobody to talk to, you can't go to the police. So she's standing in front of the orphanage and she doesn't know what to do. The children are coming back from the hike. The little boy sees his mother. He starts running towards her and he shouts, Mama, I'm still yours. I didn't drink it. Which means that what made him refuse this tempting drink was not because he was a tzaddik, he was ultra-orthodox, he was spiritual. He was his mother's child. And he wanted to be able to say to his mother, I am yours. She wouldn't drink it, he doesn't drink it. That way, I'm still yours. This is an incredible wisdom. What is more valuable than love? He could have said, Mama, I love you. That wouldn't have been so powerful. He said, I'm yours. That is much more powerful than love. Marriage doesn't mean we love each other. Marriage means I'm yours. All of me, not just my feelings. There's another word that is more powerful than love, and that's called home. When you think about the word home, it is, it is so amazing. If you remember the story when the Israeli soldiers came into Entebbe, into the airport, the hostages had been there for a long time, a hundred Jews. They were miserable. And what did these young soldiers, what were the words they chose to say to the hostages when they broke into the room? We love you. They said, let's go home. Perfect. Nelech habaita. You couldn't pick better words than that. Because there are no better words than that. So these are the two words that describe marriage. I'm yours. We are home. When you walk into your home... you are exactly where you're supposed to be. What you do at home is exactly what you're supposed to do. And the person you share that home with, that's exactly the person you're supposed to be with. That is so much more powerful than love. But what does it take? What does it take to be mine? What does it take to be home? Why sometimes people come into their own home and it doesn't feel right? God forbid. Because that's the worst thing. You come into your own home and, and you don't feel like you belong there? That's terrible. Yeah. What does it take? A very simple thing. Me. Me is too rigid. The me is too hard. It doesn't flex. It doesn't bend. It doesn't leave room for somebody else. So God gives us this living example. 
he is God and he is perfect and he is everything and, and he, not enough. I am me. I love, I want, I need, I... That I has to become softer. It's unhealthy when it doesn't have any flexibility. If the I doesn't leave room for the you, then the I is unholy. The reason Paray didn't let the Jews leave Egypt is because his I could not flex. I have to let you? I do what I want. It took 10 plagues to soften up his eye. So this is what all of Torah and mitzvahs are all about. Before you put food in your mouth, you make a bracha. You know what that does? It makes the eye a little softer. I want to eat. It's my food. Yeah, but before you can eat your food, you have to make a bracha. Soften up. Lighten up. So the third ingredient in making a marriage, the first is, you got to be mine. The second thing is, this is our home. We belong. The third thing is, where is your sense of humor? Why are you so serious about yourself? If you can't make fun of yourself, if you can't laugh at yourself, you're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not healthy. The healthiest person is a person who can laugh at himself. And when you think, I'm a good husband, that's enough reason to laugh. Because nobody is a good husband. It's a ridiculous thought. You're a good husband? Do you know what it takes to be a good husband? Like the rabbi was saying, you'll be a good husband after you die. Then everybody will say, oh, he was a good husband. But as long as you're alive, you know what it takes to be a good husband? Come on. And it's not a failure on your part. It's just human condition. To be a good husband, you have to be an angel. And you're not. To be a good wife, it's almost impossible. Be a good mother, are you kidding? Be a good father? We shouldn't even think in those terms. No mother is good enough. No father is good enough. No daughter is good enough. No son is good enough. No wife, no husband is good enough. And no Jew is good enough. Can you imagine saying, yeah, I'm a good Jew? Really? Yes, I put on tefillin every day. One pair or two pair? <laughs> There's never good enough. In these areas, being a Jew, being a, a spouse, being a child, being a father or a mother, you cannot be good. You just have to be devoted. So what's a bad mother? A bad mother is a mother who doesn't want to be a mother. That's bad. What's a bad Jew? Someone who wishes he wasn't Jewish. That's really bad. What is a bad son or daughter? If you wish you weren't, that's not good. But if you're willing, if you're committed, yes, I am your husband. That's it. That's as good as you can get.
And then you'll make mistakes, you'll do some good things, some bad things. You say, yes, I want to be a Jew. Am I going to be a perfect Jew? Somebody, a non-Jew, I was talking to him. And I said, you know, the Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments. I said, no, no, we have 613 commandments. He says, really? Where do you have time? <laughs> How do you have time to do 613 commandments? I said, that's not my only problem. I can't even remember the 613. So I'm going to say I'm a good Jew. But I want to be a Jew. That's perfect. Am I a good father? I love being a father. That's it. Good, bad, best, worst. Don't even go there. And that's what a husband and wife are. If you can't laugh at how ridiculous it is for two human beings who are not perfect to try to be married to each other, that's funny. It's funny. That God even allows us to get married. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. So if you get a little too serious, and you say, hey, I'm a good husband, you're not appreciating me. Don't, don't get so serious. Laugh at your, at your failings. Because it's funny. It's funny how we try to be perfect knowing that we can't. So these are the three things that will make your marriage wonderful. You belong, you are home, and it's funny. And when you have these three things, you're going to love it. Of course you're going to love it. How could you not? What don't you love? You don't love having someone? You don't love being home? And you don't love laughing at yourself? So that's where the love comes in. It's not necessary. It's your reward. If you do it all right, you are rewarded that you love what you're doing. You love the relationship. You love being a husband. You love being a wife. Because what's better? Nothing. Nothing better. So that's why, if you remember, Tevye. Remember Tevye? Yeah. Huh? From the Gemara? Yeah. Uh -huh. Tevye says to Golda, do you love me? What does Golda say? And she was very smart. <laughs> She says, for 25 years, I've cooked your meals, washed your clothes. What does that have to do with love? What she was saying is, do I love you? I don't love you. I do love you. What are you, what are you wasting your time on foolish things? For 25 years, I am yours. There's nothing more powerful than that. And that's why Moshiach should come to us, even though he didn't come to our grandparents who were much better than us. So why would he come to us? Because in spite of everything that has happened, and in spite of all of our mistakes and failings, we never stopped being his. The little boy says, Mama, I'm still yours. I didn't drink it. And we can say to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we did drink it, but we're still yours. We never stopped being yours. And for that alone, Moshiach should come and 
put an end to all the pain and all the suffering and make the world what God wants the world to be. A place where he and Bnei Yisrael, Am Yisrael, are married happily in their home where they belong and the rest of the world can come and dance at our wedding. Good night. Partner with Rabbi Friedman. Visit itsgoodtoknow.org forward slash support. Thank you.